Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having me here today. Um, I just got to preface this talk with a uh, couple of things. Um, there's a lot of stuff I'm going to go over. It's going to seem a little disjointed, but it all has to do with respiratory problems in kids. Okay? That's one thing. Second, I know this is a pretty diverse group here, and it's always hard putting a lecture together for a bunch of different people. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that I hope will pertain to everybody in this audience at some point. There are some videos in here, too, that um, most of them I found on YouTube. None of them are copyrighted, as far as I know. I check for that, so I should be able to use them okay without Scott getting sued for anything. Um, and, um, and so we're going to go over a, a lot of stuff here today, and I see we've got Price Chopper Spring Water. It's direct from Neil Golub's Garden Hose. Um, the, um, so anyway, uh, we'll, get, we'll get started here, and uh, if there's any questions, try to save them for the end. Uh, write them down or something, and uh, I'll try to answer them for you, okay? I got to work. This computer monitor over here isn't working, so I got to work off this screen here, so just bear with me, okay? Let's hope these things work. I'm hoping they work. Not advancing. Let's see. Keyboard. Okay, here we go. Goals and objectives. Every talk has to have goals and objectives, okay? These are mine. Fill an hour with useless information. Avoid finishing early so there's no time for questions. Have enough money in retirement. Five years I can quit AMC and work at the L.L. Bean store. <laughs> and finally, go fly fishing in New Zealand. Those are the goals and objectives. All right, now to start off, we have some general symptoms of respiratory failure in kids, okay? I know we have some nurses in the audience here from our PICU. You guys have seen this a million times. Some people haven't, but these are, are nonspecific symptoms of respiratory distress or respiratory failure in children, okay? And there's three things, grunting, flaring, and retracting. And I'm going to show you some videos, and you'll see exactly what it is. Otherwise, I'd have to get Chad Pisano down here to, to act it out for me. <laughs> so this is the first one. Oh, geez, hang on. This is the first one. I got to figure out how to get this to work now without the pointer on there. Uh, Scott, around? It's a video. I, I don't know how to start it up here. Oh, there it is. Okay, let's see if it works. And it's not working. Ah, oh, there it goes. Okay. All right. Now, see this little guy here. See how his sternum is getting sucked in, and his rib cage is collapsing in, and his belly's coming out. Okay, the retractions are sternal retractions that he's got intercostal and subcostal retractions. And the breathing pattern that he's got is what's called paradoxical respiration, where the chest wall sort of sinks in and the abdomen looks like it's coming out. Okay, it's like a seesaw movement. Okay, everybody see that? We'll move on to the next one. Okay, here's a little guy here. This is a newborn. Whoops. Keeps advancing. I try to. Okay, this little kiddo's a newborn. And just listen to this one. And you'll see, if you look at the kid's breathing, you'll see it's about the same as the other kid. He's got the subcostal retractions. He's got, he looks like he's distressed. He doesn't look like a comfortable kid. You hear that noise he's making? That's grunting. Okay? And what grunting is, it's an attempt by a kid or a baby or whatever, a kid, to try to generate positive end expiratory pressure so they oxygenate better. They're exhaling against a partially closed glottis. So they're trying to generate something called PEEP, okay? All right, now this guy, this guy's pretty sick, this, this dude here. So we'll see how he breathes. He's in the process of getting intubated. And if you look at his breathing pattern, you see, once again, he's got the same type of thing. He's got the intercostal retractions. His belly's coming out. He's got an incredibly long expiratory phase, too. And this is a guy who's got a severe case of asthma who's in the process of getting intubated. Okay? So everybody saw those chest movements there? And this little kiddo here, this has got something else I didn't mention, but it's good to see. Something called head bobbing. You see how the kid's head's bobbing up and down? That's because he's using his neck accessory muscles to try to elevate the di elevate his rib cage so he can breathe. Okay? All of these things, all of these things we're looking at, it's all increased use of accessory muscles to try to get air down into the lungs. I don't know what's wrong with these kids. Okay, but they, they, they do have some sort of respiratory problem. And when you see these signs and symptoms, it's a kid you have to keep a close eye on. Okay, because they can get worse before they get better. So I don't know what's wrong with them. All I know is that all, all these kids are in some sort of respiratory distress right now, and that's really all you need to know. And take it from there, and then try to figure out what's wrong. 
Okay, another thing we're gonna talk about here, now that you've seen those sort of generalized symptoms, is something called Strider, okay? And I do have a, a video of a kid with Strider too that we'll take a look at. <clears throat> what Strider is, it's turbulent flow in the airway, okay? Turbulent flow happens in any sort of hydraulic system when the tube gets smaller, okay? Like in a top, if you thought that was a river with logs floating down it, it comes to a narrowing in the river, the logs get all backed up. The flow beyond that is turbulent. You can see where it gets turbulent flow with the squiggly line there. If you look at a river, one of my favorite places to be, if you look at a river, you'll see that when a river narrows, the flow becomes turbulent, okay? Because that mass of water has to pass through that narrowed passageway in the river. So it becomes turbulent flow. That's what that white water is there. The same thing happens in an airway whenever an airway gets narrowed. The flow becomes turbulent. Turbulent flow means increased resistance to get, getting air down into the lungs. And if it's bad enough, the kid's going to develop a lot of those symptoms we just saw, along with a characteristic noise called strider. Okay, strider I already mentioned is turbulent air flow in a narrowed upper or lower airway. Okay, it can be either. It's always a sign of partial airway obstruction. Okay, partial airway obstruction because by a lot of things. It could be something the kid was born with. It could be the kid's got a peanut down in his airway. It could be he's got a piece of food down there. The most common thing that obstructs an airway though is the tongue, particularly for your pre-hospital guys with a kid's comatose and stuff. Most common cause is the tongue. It can be inspiratory strider where, where it, you hear it on in, in, inhalation. It could be expiratory when you hear it on exhalation, or it could be both. Um, it can be chronic or acute. It could be a kid who was born with it and has had it for months and months, or it could be a completely healthy kid who developed it over the span of a couple of days, all right? And it can cause very impressive retractions depending on how narrow the airway is. If you think in terms, I'll give you like, a, let's say a, a baby, okay? A baby's got an airway about the size of a pencil, maybe a little bigger, okay? The narrowest portion of a kid's airway is a cricoid ring, which sits just below the vocal cords. As much as one millimeter of swelling of the tissues around that cricoid ring can lead to a significant increase in airway resistance. Okay, that's the sort of caliber of stuff we're dealing with here. And this is a little guy with Strider. Hear that noise he's making? That's Strider. He's trying to get air past the narrowed opening in his airway. And he's got inspiratory Strider because you only hear it when he inhales. And when he exhales, you don't hear it. So what could be causing this? In a kid this age, almost always, a kid who looks pretty comfortable like this, who's not all distressed and disturbed and everything, um, there are two common anatomical things that can cause this. One of them is something called laryngomalacia. In the slide closest to me, that's what this child's airway looks like, okay, when he's exhaling, okay? You can see the vocal cords are wide open. See that diamond-shaped black thing in there? That's the vocal cords, all right? I gotta talk into the mic, I gotta remember to do that. Um, that's the vocal cords, the diamond-shaped black thing in the slide closest to me. When a child inhales, you see that disappears. The tissues in the larynx sort of get sucked into the opening of the airway, okay? which produces the strider. It narrows the airway down when the kid's trying to inhale. So what, what do we do for this? You don't do anything because 99.9% .9 of the time as the kid gets bigger, he outgrows it. And as long as the airway obstruction is not so severe that they might need a tracheostomy or something like that, the child can live with it just fine because it is gonna go away. Now, this is the other entity that can cause strider, and in this case, it's usually strider on expiration. The other one is inspiration because it's up in the neck. This, was, this one's on expiration because it's down in the chest. And what tracheomalacia is, if you think in terms of anatomy, our trachea is sort of surrounded by cartilage that form a skeleton for it, that keep it supported. With tracheomalacia, either those, those cartilaginous rings are not well formed or they're soft, okay? They're not mature yet. And what happens is, is if you look at the airway closest to me, that's a normal trachea, okay? And that, that normal trachea is what this would look like on inspiration, okay? Remember the other kid with the laryngomalacia, the airway is all collapsed on itself on inspiration. In the trachea, however, because of different dynamics within the chest, I'm not gonna go into all elastic forces and stuff like that. The airway stays open during inspiration, but when he exhales, 
it becomes very narrowed and slit-like. Okay, you can see that on the slide. The airway collapses down, and these kids are very often confused with asthma. They're very often misdiagnosed as having asthma because it, sometimes the strider down in the trachea can almost sound like a wheeze, and these children have a very prolonged expiratory phase. It takes them a while to get air out because of that narrowing when they're trying to exhale, which is just what happens with asthma, too. It's the same thing, okay? So with strider, if it's in the upper airway, it's usually inspiratory. If it's in a lower airway, it's expiratory, okay? Just based on dynamics in the airway during the various phases of the respiratory cycle. Okay. Uh, now, laryngomalacia, the only way really to diagnose laryngomalacia is if you put a scope in the kid's mouth and look at that upper airway. You really can't see it on an x-ray or anything. However, tracheomalacia, you can. If you look, um, uh, if you look at this, the x-ray closest to me, these are lateral x-rays, chest x-rays, you can see where that arrow is. See, the, there's a column of air just above that, that sort of grayish area, and another column of air below it, and it gets pinched off right where that arrow is, okay? That's tracheomalacia. On the other one, you can see that this is two phases of respiratory uh, effort on the other one. One is during expiration. The A x-ray is during expiration. So the airway is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, inspiration. So the airway is wide open. When the kid tries to exhale, you can see where the two arrows are. It collapses right down on itself. You don't see that column anymore. Okay, unfortunately, I don't have a pointer here, but I think the arrows explain it pretty well. Can everybody see that difference in those films? All right. So tracheomalacia, you can make the diagnosis with x-ray. You don't need to run a scope down the kid's, uh, kid's airway. But sometimes you do if the kid's still got strider and you don't find anything on x-ray, which sometimes happens. Another thing that can cause strider. Now, those two things are usually chronic causes of strider. Now we're going to get into the more acute causes. And one of the things that can be really bad is something called a retropharyngeal abscess. And what this is, it's a pocket of pus that develops in the very back of the mouth. Okay, behind the uvula, that thing that hangs down from your soft palate. Um, and what these x-rays are showing you here, the first one closest to me is a normal airway film, okay? If you look at the next one, you see where that arrow is? There's that big bulge of sort of grayish tissue sticking out. That's a retropharyngeal abscess. And if those things get large enough, you can see it's already starting to impinge. Well, you can't really see it, but anatomically, it's starting to impinge on his airway. Okay, it's starting to block off the airway. So this is a real medical emergency and surgical emergency. Very often if these are bad enough, you have to get an ENT to see the kid. They stick a needle in there, drain the pus out, he goes on antibiotics, okay? So a retropharyngeal abscess can be severe. Most of the time we pick them up pretty early where they don't need surgery and we can get them on antibiotics and give them oxygen and stuff like that until the swelling comes down. But it can be really acute. These kids look sick as hell too when you see them. They have high fevers, they look toxic, they don't look like well kids. So retropharyngeal abscess can be a real emergency. And you can see why, because that tissue just keeps swelling up with pus and it can block the airway completely. Okay, the other thing, we never see this anymore. I haven't seen a case of epiglottitis in probably 20 or 25 years, so I'm just gonna put this up here for historical interest. Um, what epiglottitis was is a bacterial infection in children. Um, the epiglottis is a thin uh, piece of tissue that overlies the airway so we don't swallow food down into our trachea all the time. It acts as like a valve. Um, so what used to happen, they used to get a bacterial infection with something called H. flu, Haemophilus influenza, and the epiglottis would swell up to the point where it would obstruct the airway. Once again, these kids looked very sick. They had high fevers. They were toxic looking, as we say. They didn't look well. They were usually drooling. They wouldn't lay down flat because the airway would obstruct even more. They wouldn't take anything by mouth. And if they talked, it sounded like they almost had like a potato stuck in their throat. Okay? And this, once again, this is one of those things. This was tr a true airway emergency. When we had a kid with a diagnosed epiglottitis, what we used to do was call up ENT and anesthesia, do nothing with the kid because you don't want to get them upset. And I'll tell you why in a few minutes. You don't want to get them upset and they would be whisked off to the OR to get intubated under anesthesia in the OR and if they couldn't get them intubated, they'd get an emergency tracheostomy done, okay? The reason we don't see this anymore is from the miracle of vaccines, okay? We never see epiglottitis anymore, okay? And it's from the Hib vaccine that has eliminated this life-threatening illness. Okay, the other thing we still see a lot of, unfortunately, is croup. 
Croup will cause strider too, and once again, it's inspiratory strider because it's up in the neck. What happens with croup, the tissues below the vocal cords become inflamed and swollen, okay? Um, adults, we get laryngitis. Kids get the croup. Um, if you look at these x-rays, there's a characteristic finding when you can see the airway. It's what's called a steeple sign or Empire State Building sign or a pencil point sign. And if you look at the, the x-ray right in the middle there, if you follow that sort of darkish column right in the middle up to where those arrows are, you can see where it gets narrowed. It sort of gets pinched off. It looks like the top of a steeple or the top of the Empire State Building. Okay? That's typical finding with croup. It's a narrowing of the airway just below the vocal cords, and a kid gets strider, and they usually have a barking cough like a seal. Okay? Um, and the other film on the end just shows you the same thing where the arrow is, and in fact, you can see the column there better Right smack in the center, it's that dark column in the center. You see as it comes up to the neck, it just narrows right down almost nothing. And croup, believe it or not, it's usually a benign illness, but it can be pretty severe. We, we had a lot of kids in the ICU with croup this winter. And this guy here, this is a pretty impressive uh, video. This kid does have the croup. Hear that noise he's making? I'm amazed that this was obviously done in a kid's house. It's one of those YouTube videos. And I'm amazed this kid's not en route to a hospital. Because this guy's an extremist. He can barely breathe now. So, um, But that's how bad croup can be. Most kids, they do just fine. They get a little bit of strider, they get a cough. But it can progress to something like this, too. OK, one more thing i got to tell you about strider is something called bacterial tracheitis. And this is also a frightening illness, too. Um, at the outset, bacterial tracheitis is very similar to croup. In fact, it starts just like croup does, a barking cough, a little bit of a fever. Most kids with croup, they're over it in about three to four days. It starts to ease off, okay? What happens with bacterial tracheitis, they get a secondary bacterial infection down in the trachea, okay, on top of their viral infection that they have from the croup. They get a secondary bacterial infection, and what happens is the trachea actually starts to fill up with pus. Okay, so it's a trachea below the vocal cords that's filling up with pus. If you look in their mouth, their mouth looks fine. Okay, lots of times the diagnosis, these kids just look so bad when you see them. Um, when they come in, they need to be intubated right away. And when you do put an airway in them, you start suctioning out gallons of pus from their trachea. This really foul looking stuff. Once the pus is cleared, they're on antibiotics, they're intubated for a few days, and you get them extubated. But the airway can fill up it with pus. In fact, in my, my early days as an attending at AMC, we actually had a kid die from bacterial tracheitis. He came in with an acutely obstructed airway. Even with an ET tube in, we couldn't get him cleared, and he arrested and died. So bacterial tracheitis, we don't see it frequently, but it's something that's always in the back of our mind when we get a history of a child who's had the croup for a few days, isn't getting any better, still having high fevers, and starting to look worse and worse as each day goes on, okay? So that's bacterial tracheitis. And I said, the, the mouth above the glottis looks normal. Okay, what do we do for a kid with Strider? The first thing we do is keep him calm. Okay, remember, strider is always a sign of partial airway obstruction. We don't want the kid to get upset and convert the partial airway obstruction into a complete airway obstruction. Then you have a real emergency to deal with, okay? So you want to keep the kid calm. If you think the child has croup, you could give him something called racemic epinephrine, which is just an inhaled epinephrine, which helps bring the swelling down in the throat. Hopefully the child will breathe a little better. Remember. You don't need to bring it down a lot. A millimeter or two can make a world of difference in the way the child's breathing. Heliox is a mixture of helium and oxygen, all right? 70% helium, 30% oxygen. That doesn't do anything for the underlying illness. However, what it does, if you think once again in terms of hydraulics, it makes the air going down into our lungs more slippery. It makes it less dense, okay? If you decrease the density of a fluid going through a narrowed airway, that turbulent flow or narrowed pipe or airway, whatever you want to call it, that turbulent flow becomes laminar once again, and it's easier for the child to breathe. 
When you put Heliox on a kid with croup, it works within seconds, 15 seconds, the kid looks better, okay? If you wanna see if he can come off, you take the mask off his face, watch him for a few seconds. If the symptoms come back, you put the mask back on, okay? It doesn't do anything for the underlying problem, but it does bide you time for the swelling to come down and a kid hopefully to breathe a little easier, okay? And then um, the final thing down there is IV or PO steroids. Steroids are always good in croup. Um, you can give them IV, you can give them uh, orally. Uh, as an outpatient, lots of times you use it orally. For inpatients, we almost exclusively give them IV stuff, okay? And steroids, they're anti-inflammatories and they help bring the swelling down. So that's treatment for Strider, but the main thing is that number one thing up there, keep the kid calm, don't piss them off, okay? <laughs> All right, what, what about wheezing? We're gonna move on to wheezing now. This is Chad's favorite band, Weezer. All right, what is wheezing? Wheezing is narrowing of the small airway, not the large airway. We went over large airway stuff, now we got small airway. Wheezing can be inspiratory, expiratory, or both. Once again, it can be acute or chronic. Some kids wheeze all the time, we call them happy wheezers. They're completely unaware going about the days, they, their daily living and they're wheezing like crazy. Um, <clears throat> Most often when you hear a child wheezing above the age of one, it's asthma. If a kid's less than the age of one, it's usually bronchiolitis, and there is a difference between the two. The symptoms are almost the exact same, but bronchiolitis is spurred on by a, by a viral infection. Asthma can also be spurred on by, by a viral infection too, but there's a whole host of other things that can do it too. This is just a graphic of asthma. You can see the bad looking airway is the one closest to me, the other one's wide open. Okay, these are all things that can cause asthma. It could be viral, it could be allergic, it could be due to exercise, it could be cold air, it could be seasonal, it could be emotional, it could be cardiac asthma. Kids that have heart disease who are in borderline heart failure can wheeze and act like they have asthma. The reason they have asthma is because they have extra fluid in the lungs that's making them wheeze, okay? So it's cardiac asthma. So we get kids in every once in a while that have congenital heart surgery done. Before they had the surgery, they were diagnosed with asthma and they were being treated for asthma. Almost always when a surgery is done, their asthma is gone, okay, because it was so-called cardiac asthma. But that's just a laundry list of things that can cause asthma. This is a typical x-ray of a kid who has asthma. Those arrows are pointed at the diaphragms. And if you look at the diaphragms, they should, on an inspiratory film, when you take an inspiratory x-ray, the diaphragm should be down around the 10th rib. They're down lower than that. I'm not gonna count the ribs out, but they're down around the 11th rib or so. And you can see that they're flat. They should be a nice dome shape. That one arrow on closest to me, the yellow arrow closest to me is pointing at the flattened diaphragm. The other arrow is, po is pointing at the uh, left diaphragm that's pushed way down, okay? Can everybody hear me? I keep moving this mic around. It's kind of a pain, but. Um, and the, the, the lateral x-ray on the um, other side, uh, that arrow just shows that the anterior posterior diameter of the chest is increased, okay? What happens with asthma? You get air trapped down in the lungs, so the lungs expand. That's, that's what's going on. They can't get the air out. Here's another film of asthma. Um, just to give you an example, if you look at the x-ray closest to me, you can once again see the diaphragms are pushed down. <clears throat> the lungs are what we call hyperaerated. I just have that other film up there to show you that that kid also has pneumonia on that film. You can see that whitish area at the top there, um, and that's pneumonia, and he's probably got some pneumonia in the, in the right middle and, and uh, right lower lobes too, okay? Just show you the difference between asthma and pneumonia. They can coexist. That's the value of x-rays. That's why we get x-rays on kids in the hospital. Okay, what do we do to treat asthma? We give albuterol and lots of it, okay? What does lots of it mean? Um, when we have a, really bad asthmatic in the PICU, we will have them on 15 to 20 milligrams an hour of albuterol, continuously, okay? It's a lot of albuterol. The kid's heart rate's gonna go up, they're gonna get shaky, they're gonna get nervous. It's a lot better than being intubated, okay? So I always try, when I get a call from a referring doc who's got a kid with severe asthma, to try to talk him into using these much higher doses of albuterols. They're reluctant to do it sometimes, but I can talk them into it. Okay, if they don't have the capability of delivering continuous NEBS, then I'll tell them, you give the kid a 10 milligram albuterol treatment now and then give them five milligrams every 20 minutes until our transport team gets there, until the kid gets to AMC. So don't be stingy with albuterol. This is all based on data that came out of Toronto Sick Children's Hospital probably 20 years ago or close to it, um, and it works. 
It saves a lot of kids from going on ventilators. Steroids, you can give them IV or PO, and in, in the, when they're in the PICU, I just use them IV. Um, there, is some, there are some data from uh, emergency rooms that say oral steroids are as effective as IV steroids in the emergency room setting. So lots of times kids that are in the ED, they'll get a dose of oral steroids when they arrive. And then if they need to be admitted, I usually convert them over to IV steroids because I don't want them throwing up in the ICU. You guys had a lecture previously on pediatric decontamination. What was that, changing diapers and cleaning up vomit? Is that, <laughs> that what that was? <laughs> Ipratropium. <laughs> Ipratropium is a synthetic atropine. It works on different receptors from albuterol. Um, it, you don't give this stuff frequently. You can give Ipratropium every six hours. Um, and in severe asthmatics, I almost always use the stuff. Uh, once again, the data was out of Toronto Sick Children's that showed if you introduce Ipratropium early in the course of status asthmaticus that the child improves more rapidly than if you just use albuterol alone or delay giving ipratropium. Magnesium sulfate, it's like a miracle drug. Nobody knows how magnesium sulfate works. They think it's a direct uh, uh, bronchodilator, works on a, on a bronchial smooth muscle, dilates it directly. Um, the usual dose that I use of magnesium is about 25 milligrams per kilogram. You can go as high as 50 if you need it. And I dose it every 20 minutes to half hour, depending on how the child's doing. If I get up to about four doses of this stuff, I check a magnesium level, because I don't want the child getting hypermagnesemic, which can be a bad thing, too. So magnesium is a good drug, and all this stuff is stepwise. We don't give them magnesium right off the bat. We try all this other stuff first. Ketamine. Ketamine is another wonderful drug. It's an IV general anesthetic. Um, once again, it's one of those mystery things. Nobody really knows how it works in asthma. It was actually found incidentally by some people in anesthesia who used it as a medication to intubate a child with asthma, and they found when they gave him ketamine, his wheezing went away. Okay? So it's an IV general anesthetic. It does cause a sympathetic discharge when you get it, just like any anesthetic does. It causes a dissociative state in the kid. They can be talking, looking around, but they're completely unaware of what's going on with, with, uh, on around them. Um, we use ketamine a lot to, in the hemoc clinic when the hematologists want to do a bone marrow aspirin on a kid. We use ketamine, and they do fine with it. But it also works well in asthma, too. Uh, terbutaline is a nonspecific beta agonist, as opposed to albuterol, which is a specific beta agonist. Terbutaline is nonspecific. We use it rarely because if we're aggressive enough with these other treatments, we don't need to get there. But if we do... Kid at this point definitely needs to be in an ICU, definitely needs to be monitored. Um, Turbutaline can cause some nasty stuff. It can cause uh, tachyarrhythmias. It can cause blood pressure problems. Um, and they really need close monitoring on turbutaline. One thing I forgot to mention, when you do use high-dose albuterol on children, sometimes you'll see their saturation start to fall a little bit if you got them on a pulse oximeter. And I'm not going to go into the whole dynamics of that, but what it does, it causes a little maldistribution of ventilation and perfusion in the lungs when you're using it at a, as a high dose. So your saturations can actually fall a little bit. So if that happens, it doesn't necessarily mean the kid's getting worse, particularly if the kid's starting to look better clinically. All right, it's strictly due to the albuterol, just so you're aware of that if you ever face that. Um, and finally, endotracheal intubation. If all of these stuff fail and this kid is heading for respiratory failure, and I don't mean by a, a bad blood gas. This is a kid who's starting to look fatigued. He's not as responsive as he was before. His eyes may be rolling up in his head. You can't wake him up, stuff like that. That's a kid who needs an airway put in, okay? Um, 90, probably 90% 90 of the kids we intubate in the ICU, we look at them clinically rather than looking at blood gases, okay? So anyway, just be aware, this is sort of a stepwise approach to asthma treatment. Okay, bronchiolitis. I mentioned this before. This is a viral lower respiratory tract infection. You usually see it in kids less than one. We had a horrendous winter this year with bronchiolitis due to a, a variety of viruses, okay? Um, and I just have these up here just to show you some differences in x-rays. Uh, the one closest to me, that white wedge at the top of the right lung there, um, that's atelectasis. You see that very frequently with bronchiolitis. Mucus plugs up the small airways and the lung collapses down on itself. And very often with these kids, if we get an x-ray the next day, it'll look completely different. That may be gone. It may be atelectatic in some other area of the lung. Okay. And the one on the other side is sort of a classic bronchiolitis film. You can see it almost looks like asthma. Remember asthma, I said the, the diaphragms are flattened out and the lungs have more air in them than they should. They're hyperaerated. Looks just like asthma, 
okay? That kid does not have any atelectasis at all. Okay, now I don't know if this is gonna, eh, well, if you look, let me see if I can get this pointer working here. If you look right about there, you see that round circular thing? Sort of looks like a little donut, okay? Um, that's something called peribronchial cuffing, all right? The reason that's an important finding on x-ray, I always teach this to residents, is when you see peribronchial cuffing, you, sh you shouldn't see that on an x-ray in a, in, a, in a kit, okay? Because the, the wall of the, the bronchi are really fine, okay? The x-ray really doesn't define them. When they have peribronchial cuffing, it means there's edema around the wall of that bronchiole, okay? There's edema around it, which gives, which gives it that donut shape. That's a classic finding for a viral lower respiratory tract infection. So if you ever see an x-ray or have somebody read an x-ray and it says there's peribronchial cuffing, it's a viral lower respiratory tract infection, okay? I always look for those in bronchiolitis because you're trying to figure out if this kid's got asthma or something else. If you see that, you know it's probably viral. 99% sure it's viral, okay? I don't know, can everybody, everybody see that little donut there? There's a couple more of them, but there's one right there too. It doesn't really project too well, but, and there's one down here. Okay, and what it is, it's edema forming around the bronchi. Remember, when they get a viral infection, those lower airways, the small airways become inflamed and they get this edema around them, just like any other area that might be inflamed. Causative agents of bronchiolitis. Here's the laundry list of them. RSV, respiratory and syncytial virus, parainfluenza, adeno, influenza, metanumovirus, rhinovirus, enterovirus. We saw all of these this winter. And yeah, we saw all of those this winter. There's nothing to add to it. Um, so all of these things can cause bronchiolitis. Does it make a difference which one is causing it? No, doesn't make any difference at all. Main cause is RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. Was that a post-test question? I thought so, okay. All right. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even make them up, I just guess it. Um, so anyway, bronchiolitis is seen primarily in the fall and winter months, but you can also see it in spring and summer, okay? It doesn't necessarily, it, it peaks in the fall and winter, but you can see it through spring and summer too. It's a clinical diagnosis. It's not based on any lab tests or x-rays or anything like that. It's a clinical diagnosis. It usually starts with upper respiratory infection symptoms. Almost always there's somebody else at home that's sick with a cold or something else. Characterized by for, poor feeding. These kids' noses fill up with snot and if you know babies, they have to breathe through their nose to eat. If their nose is filled up with snot, they can't eat, so they don't eat well. Um, they have all those signs and symptoms of respiratory distress that I showed you earlier, the grunting, flaring, retracting at times, along with wheezing. Sometimes their saturations on room air will be decreased, okay? Maybe not 85, but it could be 91 or 92 or 93. Remember, they have pneumonia. It's a viral pneumonia. They can wheeze, and the other thing that they do, too, they can have apnea, where they just stop breathing for periods of time. And sometimes it's bad enough, the apnea is bad enough, we have to put them on a ventilator. Because you gotta keep stimulating them and shaking them and bag mask ventilating them. You have to do all this stuff to get the kid breathing again. So it can be pretty bad and the apnea, very often there's no wheezing along with it. They just become an apneic. Okay, um, this is just some epidemiology stuff. RSV causes about 80% of cases. There it is in print, the answer to your question. Um, <laughs> the hospitalization for kids less than a year old with bronchiolitis has doubled in the last 20 years. Why that is, I don't know. Maybe because they're indoors more now? I don't know. Exposed to more stuff? I don't know. <clears throat> the way we used to treat bronchiolitis, this is the treatment junk pile, I call it. This is stuff we used to use like crazy and it doesn't work. We found out since it doesn't work. A waste of time. So sub subcutaneous epinephrine doesn't work. Vials of... Um, RSVIG, which is RSV immune globulin, doesn't work. Ampules of interferon. Interferon was an antiviral medication. Used to be used for everything from warts to papillomas in your throat. Doesn't work for RSV. Boxes of mist tents. Mist tents were used all the time with bronchiolitis. They don't work. And crates of spag units. Spag units were these devices that we used to deliver sort of a crystalline sort of substance. Uh, this stuff called ribavirin, um, which is an antiviral which we subsequently found out was junk too. And they're still looking for a use for ribavirin for like hepatitis or something now, but 
doesn't work for this. Uh, it's bag units you can find them on eBay for about four or five bucks now. <laughs> um, these things, you're probably wasting time and money trying these things, which is inhaled Lasix. These have all been used in the past. DNAs, or uh, I forget the other name of it. DNAs, it's a mucolytic agent. Um, antihistamines, decongestants, nasal vasoconstrictors, you know, nasal sprays, they don't really do anything. Saline aerosols, there's some debate about those, but most recently they've been debunked too. They really don't do anything. Okay, now we get to some say it works and some say it doesn't. Um, when a kid's in the ICU, this is the slide I'm on, okay? Um, I always try albuterol with them. I try racemic epinephrine with them. Racemic epinephrine will decrease edema in the small airways where the obstruction is. Um, sometimes I'll give them steroids, depending on how bad they are. Um, sometimes I'll use ipratropium, which is a synthetic atropine stuff. There are some studies. It's equivocal to say whether they work or not. But if a child looks like he's heading towards a ventilator or getting worse, it's probably worth trying it. What we try to do is individualize the treatment. In other words, you give the kid an albuterol treatment, see if he gets better after it. If he does, you keep using it. If he doesn't, you forget it. Same thing with the other treatments, too. Okay, why do we test for viruses? There's a lot of reasons why we test these kids for viruses. Everybody says, well, I, I said before, I said, you can't do anything about them. They all cause the same, cause the same sort of thing. Why do we test for them? Well, they can be positive in 26 to 95% of patients. Okay, and 95% is, is a more sophisticated test that's done now. It can eliminate the so-called sepsis workup. So in other words, if you have a baby who comes in with a fever, is breathing fast and wheezing, or maybe have an apnea, okay, now you might be led down a path of a sepsis workup, which is an LP, a bladder catheterization, all that other stuff we need to do, blood cultures, antibiotics for two or three days. Or you can send a viral study if it comes back positive for RSV or influenza, you know what's wrong with the kid. And you can avoid that whole thing. If the diagnosis is unclear or you're worried about pertussis, it can help with that too, whooping cough, okay? Um, you can identify cohorts for patient rooms. If you have to double kids up, you don't want to stick an RSV kid in a room with a kid who's you know, on chemo for cancer, all right? So if you get two kids that are positive for RSV, you can put them in the same room. Who cares if they transmit it back and forth? They already got it. Um, for epidemiology, epidemiologists love following viral infection, so we like that stuff. And to evaluate therapies, too, okay? Remember, these viruses, though they all cause the same sort of syndrome, they're all different. So maybe RSV doesn't respond real well to albuterol, but maybe influenza does. I don't know. You know so there's that data that's still out there, too. Uh, management, I'm just going to go over this stuff quick. Uh, suctioning oral and nasal secretions. I mentioned that before. If the kid's nose is clogged up, they can't breathe, they can't eat. Chest PT, oxygen if the saturations have fallen. A trial of albuterol, adracemic epi, IV fluids, NPO. Antibiotics based on the history, physical, and chest x-ray. Serious bacterial infections are present in less than 2% of patients 60 days or younger. So three months, uh, two months, they come in with this respiratory illness, less than 2% have a serious bacterial infection, almost always viral. The last thing, this is brand new from the American Academy of Pediatrics, their recommendation to treat kids with bronchiolitis was oxygen and fluids and nothing else. No chest PT, no bronchodilators, nothing, okay? That was it. However, what they did was they said if a child needs to be admitted to the pediatric ICU, then sky's the limit. You can do whatever you want. So um, this is for non-ICU patients, and that's the AAP recommendations. They don't recommend chest PT. They don't recommend suctioning, none of that. Pretty much oxygen and fluids. Okay, when do we send these kids home? I'm spending a lot of time on this because this is a really common illness. Um, respiratory rate less than 60, usually. No increased work of breathing. Parent knows how to suction. Is on room air or oxygen to the level that's acceptable for everybody. Kids eating okay. Parents are okay with taking a kid home. And medications that they leave on depends on the response in the hospital. How do we prevent it? All this stuff that you do to, to prevent viral infections. Wash your hands. Don't let grandma who's got snot running out of her nose and coughing her brains out come up and kiss the kid. Um, <laughs> there's some stuff called pav 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 palavizumab. I always have problems pronouncing that. Um, what that is, it's a preventive for bronchiolitis, and it's really only indicated for uh, those kids I have up there, congenital heart disease, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, and preemies. Use some kids that are immunodeficient, that have immunodeficiency still up in the air. They don't know if it's effective in that group or not. Um, the cost of palavizumab is $3,000 to $5,000 per kid. So it's not cheap stuff. If it was 
$20, every kid would get it. <laughs> okay, this is an introductory slide to the next part here. That's it for bronchiolitis. I'm gonna move along, there's a lot of slides here today. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about Alties. These are all T's, okay? <laughs> all T's. All right, what's an Alti? An Alti always has some respiratory component to it. What an Alti is, it's an acute or apparent life-threatening event. That's what it means, okay? Always associated with some sort of respiratory difficulty. What is it? It's an unexpected change in an infant's breathing pattern that frightens the caregiver, the caretaker. Frightens is a key word here, okay? Frightens the caretaker. It could include apnea, could include a color change with the kid, change in muscle tone, the kid could be limp, flaccid, could have a seizure, could be accompanied by choking or gagging. The key ingredient is fear, okay? When this happens to a kid at home, the key ingredient is fear. And there's my biggest fear at the bottom there, Hillary with her <laughs> finger pointing at us. Um, <laughs> I should have my face below that. <laughs> Um, anyway, there's a classification for these. This is a sort of life-threatening event. These are sort of life-threatening events. These are obvious life-threatening events. And these are apparent life-threatening events. Okay, these are the ones we're talking about. Where, depending on what you do, it completely changes the outcome. Okay, all these are big challenge. It's a wastebasket term. It's not a specific diagnosis. Okay, just a waste basket. It's a syndrome, which means it's a, a constellation of symptoms. Um, it can be caused by a variety of things with a lot of different pathophysiology. It's a major headache for me when I get an ALTI admission. I really hate these things. Uh, the management needs to be individualized like everything else. Epidemiology, I'll just put this up here quick. Um, it was coined in 1986, and it replaced terms like near SIDS and, and aborted crib death. Okay, those things really don't exist anymore. Uh, there's always a potential for diagnosis, overdiagnosis, since the definition depends on observations of scared and medically untrained caregivers. Okay, um, the incidence is 0 0.5 to 1 percent in all kids. Causes, I'm going to go through these real fast. GI, up to 50 percent of cases are caused by GI problems, like reflux, swallowing abnormalities, gastric volvulus, where the stomach twists on itself, interception where the intestine sort of telescopes into itself, cause the blockage in the intestine, um, and other GI abnormalities, about 50% of them. The most common one on there is the first one, reflux. Neurologic problems can cause another 30% of them. And there's a whole bunch of them up there. Seizures, febrile seizures, CNS bleed, vasovagal, hydrocephalus, CNS infections, VP shunt malfunctions, if the kid's got a VP shunt, uh, and malignancies, okay? Respiratory problems. This is what we have to go through when we get one of these ALTI kids in. Uh, cause about another 20%. Things affecting respiratory control, obstructive apnea, vocal cord abnormalities, foreign bodies, laryngotracheomalacia, which I mentioned before, um, breath holding spells, all of this stuff. Cardiac problems can do it, like arrhythmias, like something called a long QT syndrome, something called Wolf-Parkinson-White, which is a cardiac arrhythmia. Heart rate gets really fast. Congenital heart disease of almost any type could do it. Myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart muscle, usually from a virus, can do it. And cardiomyopathies, which are heart muscles that don't function real well because there's something wrong with them. Their structure is abnormal or they're highly inflamed. Metabolic problems can do it. All kinds of things. Sepsis, infections, child abuse. Fortunately, less than 5% of all these are due to child abuse. Um, <clears throat> the thing that makes this, that can cause, present as an ALTI, Events require CPR and only occur in the presence of a single caretaker, okay? In other words, the kid has multiple events of ALTI, same person with the kid all the time, and they always doing CPR on the kid. That raises a red flag that this could be child abuse. Um, smothering, Munchausen by proxy, everybody know what Munchausen by proxy is? That's when there's secondary gain for the caretaker involved where they want to make the kid sick, so everybody's saying, oh, poor Mr. So-and-so, his kid's in the hospital all the time, nobody knows what's wrong with him. That's Munchausen by proxy. Um, for child abuse, a diagnostic evaluation almost always has no yield for things like this. In other words, you get a CT, you're not gonna see an intracranial hemorrhage. There's al almost nothing on your diagnostic exam. Uh, it sometimes requires covert videography. We had a kid, I'll just give you an example. We had a kid years ago who was, um, actually there were two. One, of this ki one kid uh, came in with these ALTI events and he was always hypoglycemic from it. 
his blood sugar was low. We could never figure out why until we videotaped, put a video camera secretly in the kid's room, and the kid's mother was injecting insulin rectally into the kid, making his sugar come down. There was another kid who was repeatedly admitted with GI bleeding problems. I don't know if Justine remembers this or not. GI bleeding problems. And we couldn't figure out why the kid had the GI bleed until a video camera was put in the room and we found out that the mom was putting her menstrual blood in the child's diaper. So that's Munchausen by proxy. And um, it's very difficult to figure that out sometimes. Um, and abusive head injuries are pretty rare. Of 243 babies admitted for evaluation of all these, six were diagnosed with a head injury. Other things that can do it, all this stuff, including four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. Okay, idiopathic. Approximately 50% are idiopathic. What that means, we don't know why this happened. Okay, it's a medication because we don't know what the hell's causing this problem. In layman's terms, just like the fame of Kim Kardashian, Popularity of Justin Bieber and Bob Dylan's Christmas CD. It's something that defies all explanation and happened for no apparent reason. It's, it's, it, it's a diagnosis of exclusion, okay? You look for everything else, and if you can't find a reason, then it's an idiopathic, alti event, and you set the kid up with monitoring and stuff for home. Um, this is sort of a checklist of all the stuff we have to ask about when a kid comes in with an alti. This is all the stuff we go through. Um, history, physical, routine lab work, is there any exposure to carbon monoxide, all, all this stuff. Diagnosis, detailed history and physical alone can make the diagnosis in about 20%, okay? Testing is usually prompted by histories and physicals. Most important diagnostic tool is a detailed description of the event and the intervention that was needed to get the kid breathing again or to eliminate the event that was happening, okay? And determine what, then you got to determine whether this was really life threatening or was it just a scary thing that happened? Okay? In other words, maybe it's kids with a babysitter, not familiar with a kid that age, something happens, the kid chokes a little bit, she gets frightened and says, oh my God, you know, almost had a cardiac arrest. I had to do this, that, and the other thing. That's a life threatening event at top, and that's just a frightening event at the bottom. Okay? <laughs> that's the difference life threatening and frightening. This is a clinical history we look for. All of this stuff here, I'm not gonna go through this slide because I don't wanna waste time going through it, but this is all the things we have to think of when a child presents with an alti. And this is a typical history. I, I would love to give this out to a parent when they come in with a kid who had an alti event. Well, little Johnny, you gotta just circle one of those things in a parentheses. Little Johnny was sleeping or eating in his crib, car seat and so on. It was an emergency room, emergency care. When he arrived, he, <laughs> I'll let you guys read it. Okay. Okay, everybody got that now? That's that's a standard that's a standard alti history form. And um, I would love to give that to a parent when they came in. Okay, initial labs, you only get that when you can't get an explanation from anything else. And it was sort of routine stuff, a CBC lights, chest x-ray if you think one's needed, EKG if you're worried about cardiac disease, maybe a tox screen. Uh, urinalysis, urinalysis can be helpful because sometimes you have an occult urinary tract infection that can cause an alti type event. Um, CT or MRI of the brain if you think there's a neurologic problem, something called polysomnography. What the heck is that? Um, these are additional diagnostic tests. I'm not going to go over all of this stuff. It, this is like a text, textbook of pediatric pathology, this stuff. Um, GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, probably the most common cause of ALTI, okay? The way you make this diagnosis is by watching the kid eat, see if he refluxes and if he has an ALTI event after that or during it, okay? Or if he's vomiting a lot, maybe aspirating, okay? Treatment for this is not always effective effective. The thing, the second thing from the bottom is pretty important. Infants are usually pretty miserable because they get heartburn from this. Okay, so they're irritable. Sometimes they keep their head extended all the time to kind of eliminate the, the irritation down there. This is a typical x-ray of a kid who's got reflux and you can see the black stuff in the kid's stomach there it shoots right up into the esophagus in both of them. Okay, there's a white one on the other side. All right. They shoot right back up into the esophagus. When a kid's swallowing that stuff, it should just go in his stomach and stay there. It shouldn't shoot back up again. 
This is another sort of reflux problem, and this can also cause alti. I've seen at least a few of these kids. Uh, this is nasopharyngeal reflux with aspiration. What happens when the kid swallows, the formula goes up into the back of his nose so he can't breathe, and in addition, it goes down into the airway. And if you look at, if you look at this, you can see the dark arrows at the top on the film nearest me. You can see all the white stuff up in the back of the kid. This is behind his nose. It's up in the soft palate, behind a soft palate and hard palate. And the two white arrows, you can see a little light streak there. That's actually the contrast going down in the kid's trachea. And you can see the same thing on the B side there. You can see the stuff coming up and going right down in the kid's trachea, okay? So when you see that, this kid needs some attention. Um, sometimes you can get away with GI motility agents, we call them. Sometimes they need something called a Nissen fundoplication. However, with nasopharyngeal reflux, that stuff doesn't work because it's while a kid's swallowing and it goes up into his nose, and that can be a real problem. So we've had at least a couple of kids with that. Polysomnography, it's a monitoring thing. I'll show you what one looks like. This is a polysomnography of a kid with central hypoventilation. What polysomnography does when you don't have it, when you're not sure what's caused the kid, and these events are genuine, you know, you're observing a kid in the hospital and you've seen these events repeatedly, you can't figure out what's doing them, then the next thing you do is a polysom, and what that is, it's an EEG, it's heart rate, it's respiratory rate, it's flow through the nose, it's all kinds of monitoring devices that get hitched up to the kid, and hopefully you'll be able to figure out why he's got these alti events, whether it's central hypoventilation, obstructive apnea, something like that, okay? Seizures, subclinical seizures would tell you on the EEG. All right, this is just a quick thing. What's the difference between SIDS and alti? Okay, SIDS, first of all, is always fatal, sudden infant death syndrome. Alti is generally not fatal, all right? The majority of SIDS victims do not, do not experience apnea prior to this kid, the SIDS event, okay? Years ago, every kid who had a, a history of a, a, a sibling who had SIDS got sent home with an apnea monitor. Every study that's been looked at at home apnea monitors for prevention of SIDS show they don't work. They don't do anything, okay? Most kids with SIDS have, don't, don't have any apnea events ahead of time. Over 80% of SIDS deaths are between midnight and 5 a.m. SIDS is a sudden infant death syndrome. You guys probably all know that. Over 80% of all these happen between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. Why is that? Because there's somebody watching the kid then. At night, they're sleeping. Nobody's checking on a kid all through the night. But during the day, they're sitting there eating their Cheetos or something, and all of a sudden, the kid can't breathe, you know? So anyway, so it's at different times. Back to sleep. The AAP recommends sleeping kids on their back now to prevent SIDS, that works great with that. It's really in, it reduced the incidence of SIDS a lot. However, it's had no bearing on the incidence of ALTIs. And SIDS is a diagnosis, ALTI is a syndrome. Management, uh, main thing here is you gotta monitor these kids in the hospital. It doesn't matter what the story is. If you think it's an ALTI, they come into the hospital, they get monitored to see if it happens again, see if you can reproduce it. Apnea, let's see, what do I have here? Apnea, I think we'll skip some of this stuff because I want to get to the very last part and I only got about five or 10 minutes left. Apnea is, it, there's a lot of overlap with apnea and alties. Okay, apnea means the kid stops breathing, which is pretty much what alti is too. But questions I ask, has it happened before? How long did it last? What was the kid doing when it happened? Any change in skin color? He turned blue, pale, whatever. Was there any vomiting? What needed to be done to get the kid breathing again? Was it stimulation? Did you do mouth to mouth? Did you do CPR or something else? Okay, once again, the, the, the diagnostic groups overlap with ALTIs. It's almost the same thing. Apnea treatment, usually none's required other than observation and see if you can figure out what's going on. Okay, caffeine is up there. If you look at possible, caffeine is there. Caffeine is used a lot in um, kids that don't have well developed respiratory centers yet, it's used as a respiratory stimulant. Okay, so ex-premies that have apnea or premature kids that have apnea, caffeine is often used to stimulate their respiratory centers to get them to breathe. This is an important slide, a note on a blue baby, okay, especially for pre-hospital guys. Um, if you ever come across a blue kid and the saturations don't improve somewhat with oxygen, almost always that kid's gonna have a cardiac disease, okay, a cyanotic heart disease. Um, tiring while feeding and feeding intolerance are early symptoms of congestive heart failure. Babies in congestive heart failure have a very tough time eating, okay, because they're trying to breathe. Um, the younger and bluer the kid, 
the higher the likelihood of congenital heart disease. If a kid's two weeks old and he's really blue, he's probably got congenital heart disease. Um, prostaglandins are things that are often started empirically on babies who are blue to keep something called a ductus arteriosus open. The thing you need to know about prostaglandins, if you are faced with a kid who's on prostaglandins, prostaglandins can cause apnea, so you need to be prepared to treat that or take care of it, okay? And if they are having severe apnea from the prostaglandins, they'll end up on a ventilator, okay? Um, one more thing about blue babies. I get a lot of phone calls from, I shouldn't say a lot, I get, occasionally get phone calls from docs at other hospitals saying, I got a kid there, he looks terrible, he's blue, okay, and they're worried that the kid's in septic shock, all right? And I'll give you a good example. One time I got that exact phone call and I heard this baby screaming in the background. And I asked the doc, I said, the baby you're talking about, is it the kid who's in the background is screaming right now? And he said, yeah. And I said, I'll tell you right now, this kid's got some sort of congenital heart disease. It's not sepsis, because when babies get blue from sepsis, they look like they're dead. They're not screaming so loud that I can hear them on the phone. Kids that are blue and look pretty vigorous, by pretty vigorous, I mean they're not unconscious, they're moving around, sometimes crying loudly. Almost always that's congenital heart disease, okay? Just a little clinical hint. Okay, this will be the last thing now. Do I have enough time to finish up here, Scott? All right. Um, this is just some stuff, because we're getting into the summer, and it is a respiratory problem. I'm just going to talk a little bit about drowning, okay? And I call this part between the devil and the deep blue sea. <laughs> some definitions for you. Drowning dies within 24 hours of admission to the hospital. A near drowning survives the first 24. Wet drowning and dry drowning, don't worry about that too much. Wet drowning means they aspirated fluid. Dry, there's no aspiration. Something called the immediate disappearance syndrome. That's when somebody dives into the water, they don't come up again. They drown. Why does that happen? It's believed to be due, at least some of them, due to something called a long QT syndrome, which is a cardiac abnormality. It's an abnormality with your heart rhythm where you hit the cold water and it causes your heart to stop. Okay, that's immediate disappearance syndrome. If you look for definitions of what constitutes cold water and warm water and really cold water, that's sort of a consensus. Warm water is anything above 68. Cold water is considered less than 68, and very cold water is less than 41. Okay, um, that's debatable. I had to look at a lot of papers to get these numbers, and this sort of was a ballpark uh, number for this. Okay, some new definitions. The World Congress on Drowning give this big long-winded thing. It's a process of experiencing respiratory impairment from submersion, immersion, in liquid, okay? However, what they did do is clear up the outcomes. Either it was death, no morbidity, or morbidity. And if there was morbidity, it was further characterized as moderately disabled, severely disabled, vegetative state coma, and brain dead. Okay? All right? So that wet drowning, dry drowning stuff is sort of out the window. This is sort of a more progressive way to look at drowning. Epidemiology this is the fourth leading cause of death in five to 14 year olds, and it's 11th in zero to four year olds. There's about a half a million deaths annually worldwide. Third most common cause of unintentional injury in the United States, and the second leading cause of death in one to 19 year olds. In the temperate US, about 90, between 70 and 90 happen, 70 and 90% occur in pools. Here's graphic proof that women are smarter than men. These are de deaths per 100,000 population. Um, for drownings, and you can see the males uh, go way up in the teens while the women uh, go way down. Adolescents are more likely to drown in open water, not in pools. They're more likely to drown in lakes, rivers, um, oceans. Um, the five males for every one female drowning victim, because males are stupid. Um, children less than four account for about 60% of pool drowning accidents. African American Native kids or uh, Native Americans are at higher risk. Some epidemiology stuff, 92% of survivors are found in less than two minutes, okay? 86% of non-survivors are found after 10 minutes. 15% of all drowning admissions die in the hospital and another 20% suffer severe brain damage, okay? Not a good thing. Um, this was a fascinating thing that I found in one paper. 90% of all drownings occur within 10 meters of safety. That's 30 feet away from rescue. Um, 40 to 45 percent during swimming, another 30 percent while boating. 80 percent of ocean drownings occur in rips, a rip tide where you just get sucked out. Um, pool drownings in general, those kids are missing from sight about five minutes and are usually in the care of one or both parents, okay? 
Pool lo pools without fences are 60% more likely to cause drowning. This is a pathophysiology. There's something called an instinctive drowning response. And what that is, it doesn't mean you're in the water flailing your arms, screaming, help, help, help. That doesn't happen. A lot of people think it does, but it's a fallacy. When people start to drown, what happens is they concentrate on breathing and keeping their head above water. That's the two things. They're not out there screaming, help, help, help. They're flailing around trying to keep their head up and trying to keep air going in and out of their lungs. Okay, that's what they're concentrating on. So that's what the instinctive drowning response is. What happens when you go underwater? Obviously, you hold your breath. You hold it long enough, your CO2 goes up, okay? Once your CO2 gets up high enough, you get that burning sensation in your lungs, you have to inhale, so that's an involuntary gasp. Fluid goes into your larynx, then you get laryngo and bronchospasm. At this point, you may or may not get aspiration of the water or fluid that you're in, and then you get hypoxia, dysrhythmias, and death. Not a pleasant way to go. Um, the um, aspiration thing, just one thing. Sometimes you'll see in books or papers, salt water versus fresh water drowning. Doesn't make any difference. The end pathophysiology is all the same. They talk about fluid shifts and electrolyte imbalance and hemolysis. It doesn't ma that that is in experimental conditions, maybe in the real world, not. The end result is that these kids all get ARDS. They get bad lung disease from it. And here's sort of a graph. I think I pulled this from the US Navy or something with you, how long you can stay conscious in various temperatures of water. And you see if it's less than 32 degrees, you got about 15 minutes or so, okay, before you're out and drowning. 70 to 80, you got three to 12 hours, depending on what your physical condition is. Cold water drownings, a word about cold water drownings, because this is important, especially around here. These are case reports. Two and a half year old survived after 66 minutes of being underwater. A 51-year-old survived after 45 minutes, and a 62-year-old survived after 15 minutes of being underwater, and they had a good neurologic outcome. The key thing with cold water drowning is the core body temperature has to fall fast. In an experiment that was done with submerged dogs, this was a while ago, <laughs> the core temperature in a dog that was put in icy water dropped seven and a half degrees centigrade in two minutes, so they can cool fast. And that's the important thing, that there's rapid cooling. The so-called diving reflex, I'm not gonna go into that, but that's got to do with redistribution of blood flow and slowing a heart rate, may not be as great as once thought, okay? Cold water drowning, just a couple of more things here. In Seattle, uh, they looked at a series of patients, less than 20, the water was cold, rarely icy, there was no hypothermic protect, uh, protection. 92% of good survivors had a core temp above 93, but 61% of those dead or persistent vegetative state had a core temp less than 93.2. The thing here is it's that old axiom, you're not dead until you're warm and dead. But the thing is with drowning is if you've been in the water long enough, your body temperature approaches the water, whatever the water is. Okay, so this study done in Seattle looked at 20, the water was cold, it wasn't icy, no hypothermic protect, uh, protection at all. A Finnish study looked at pediatric victims in water, temperature 61 degrees. There was no benefit of hypothermia in water at 61 degrees, okay? And if you're up in Maine, 61 degrees is like being in Florida for those guys. Um, in Sonoma County in California, their EMS protocols, they, didn't, they classified no bodies of water out there as being cold cold enough to give you hypothermic protect, uh, protection. So they actually question resuscitation efforts for those submerged more than 10 minutes, okay? Predictors of good outcomes. 68 per 90 percent of all children have good outcomes after submersion. If they get CPR within two minutes, if they have spontaneous respiration after CPR, this is an important thing. If a kid starts breathing at the pool side, I can reassure the parents that that kid is gonna have practically a 100% recovery. That's a really important thing. If they start to breathe spontaneously, poolside or wherever they were pulled out of the water, that's a very good prognostic indicator for a really good neurologic function, uh, functional outcome. If their CPR duration was less than 10 minutes, Glasgow coma scale on arrival was greater than six, submersion time less than five to 10 minutes. Predictors of poor outcome, it's almost the opposite. Age is less than three. They have a tendency to be in the water longer because they wander off. Submersion time greater than 10 minutes, anoxia asystole greater than 25 minutes. If CPR is delayed more than 10 minutes, if they need ongoing CPR in the ED or CPR beyond 25 minutes, that patient is gonna do horrifically. 
Glasgow Coma Scale, less than 5. pH, less than 7.1 on their blood gas. A blood glucose, the blood glucose over 250. Um, hyperglycemia is an indicator of brain injury. In, in this patient population, there was one study done that said if their blood sugar was over 250, their neurologic outcome was terrible. Okay, because what happens is when a brain gets in, injured, you release a lot of things we call catecholamines, which makes your blood sugar go up. Okay, so when you see that, it's a bad prognostic indicator. And if the water temperature was above 50 degrees, it was a bad outcome. 50 is pretty cold, okay? Um, the reason these are up here, and the reason I put them up here, for all you guys that work at other hospitals or pre-hospital care guys who may have contact with kids who have drowned, um, what happens is these kids will show up at, at some other hospital, they'll be resuscitated there, Doc will go in and tell the parents, well, we got a heart rate and a blood pressure back. Things are looking good. We're sending them to Albany Med. In spite of the fact that maybe the kid had CPR for 45 minutes and his pupils are now fixed and dilated and the kid's flaccid or having seizures or something else, then I have to explain these parents are under the impression that this kid is going to be fine now. So all of these things are up here. Just to remind you, when you're dealing with these kids, is to be a little realistic, to know some of these prognostic indicators and say, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. But, you know, 25 minutes, a half hour resuscitation with inadequate blood flow and oxygen to the brain can, you know, the heart rate and blood pressure are okay, but we don't know what the brain's, what's going to happen to the brain, okay? So I'm not saying deprive the parents of hope, but don't give them false hopes either. Who should be hospitalized? Who gets in a hospital? If a kid submerged beyond one minute, any cyanosis or apnea, they should come in. Reco any sort of pulmonary resuscitation at all, including mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing. They should be admitted. And you need to monitor mainly for development of pulmonary edema and or aspiration pneumonia. Okay, so these are the kids who should be hospitalized. How do you prevent it? Pool fences can reduce drowning by 50 to 90%, okay? 84% of drownings happen because of inadequate adult supervision. Just watch your kids. I see people at our town pool all the time. Their kids are running around, these two and three year old kids by themselves. And mom and dad are over there, you know, reading a book or talking to their neighbors and stuff. And a kid could easily go underwater. Yeah, they have lifeguards, but the lifeguards job is tough too. You know, they have 100 kids they're watching in the pool. Um, about, half, about half of pool owners do not know CPR, okay? which to me is a crazy thing. I mean, if I had a pool, I would definitely know, I know CPR anyway, but if I had a pool and I wasn't a doc, I'd know CPR. About 50% of adults overestimate their own swimming skills. So if your kid is at the beach and he's getting sucked out and the mom jumps in the water to get, or dad jumps in the water to get the kid, they're not gonna make it because they overestimate, oh, I can get out there, no problem. The next thing you know, their mom and dad's going down. Um, 85% of kids less than 14 who drowned in boating accidents were not wearing a life jacket. Simple stuff. So what, what do, how do docs counsel these kids for counseling? Never leave the kid alone. Empty all buckets. Kids have drowned in five-gallon buckets. Toddlers have wandered over to a five-gallon bucket of paint or water or whatever. They tip over in there. They can't get themselves out, and they drown. Okay? They've drowned in toilet bowls. Kids have drowned in toilet bowls. They go over to the toilet. To use it or they're fooling around in there, head goes in and that's it, they drown. Um, keep a phone at the poolside, learn CPR. For doctors, any docs in the audience, it's a good idea to identify pool owners in your practice. And swim lessons for kids this age um, are debatable, but a lot of people do it. And what the swim lessons do, they sort of try to teach these kids at a very young age, six months to a year, if they hit water to flip themselves over on their back so they float and they can breathe and call for help. For five to 12 year old, kids should learn how to swim. There's two things kids should learn how to do. One of them is ride a bike, the other one is swim, okay? They need to know how to swim. Um, they should never swim alone or without an adult. They should wear a life jacket for boating and fishing. You gotta warn them about jumping and diving. Kids love jumping in the water. When I was in, in fellowship, we had one guy who jumped into Lake Erie into a few feet of water, snapped his neck, and ended up a quadriplegic. He didn't drown, but he ended up a quadriplegic. So jumping and diving, if they're going to jump or dive in the water, tell them to know what's on the bottom before they go in. And drowning risks in fall and winter, particularly around here. Kids are out ice skating, they're out ice fishing and stuff like that. They can easily go through the ice, okay? So around here, you have to warn them about that too. How about 13 and up? Now you get into alcohol and drugs, warn them about that stuff. Kids over 13 should at least take a basic CPR course, I think. 
Um, they should definitely learn how to swim now. And the other thing, if you have a pool at home and you have a babysitter taking care of your kids, does a babysitter know how to swim and does a babysitter know CPR? It's a good thing to ask, okay? A lot of people don't think of that stuff. And last thing, do I have time to finish, Scott? Yeah, he's giving me the five minutes, I'll be done. Okay, this is a picture of one of our tr medical transports, okay? <laughs> I'm the one that took the photo. The kid wasn't too sick. Um, transport, what's the goals of a transport? Get to the kid as quickly as possible, prevent further deterioration, get the kid to a facility, provide a level of care equal to the accepting facility or in the capabilities of your transport vehicle, okay? That's the goals of a transport team. Referring MDs, this is what they have to think of. Go to another facility, which one am I going to? Motor transport, car, ambulance, helicopter. What's the team composition that I want to come and get this kid? Can I send them with the family? Do I need an EMS? Do I need an ALS team? Or can, do I need the PED transport team? So there's different levels. Responsibilities of the transport team. Quickly assess the kid, secure all tubes and lines, get consents. We've got to treat the kid when he gets back to the hospital, so get the consents. Call the receiving hospital, let them know how the kid's doing. Anticipate problems that might be encountered on transport. Be ready. The transport is a hospital, hostile environment. You're bouncing around, you could be in a helicopter, it's noisy, got monitoring devices bouncing all over the place, you got tubes and lines. Anticipate those problems that could happen. Safe movement of the patient, get them safely from the vehicle to the hospital, and ongoing monitoring. Make sure you all your monitoring devices work. Except, except, accepting MD, that's me. Secret to success is knowing who to blame. I evaluate the appropriateness of the transport team and the mode of transport. I advise the referring doc. Advise the referring doc until the transport team gets there. Once the transport team arrives, this is now my patient. Even though I may be 50 miles away, it's my patient. Okay? Things to ask yourself if you're on a transport. How far from home? Will the weather slow us down? Has the child condition improved, worsened, or stayed the same? Do I have all the equipment I need readily available? Okay? Not tucked away in some bag, rolled up somewhere. You have the stuff you need at hand. Okay? If the kid's got an IV in, Make sure you have access to another IV if it comes out, okay? If you have them on a pump, make sure you got another pump that's working. And this is the final slide. These are words of wisdom for anybody who is dealing with kids. Expect the unexpected, be prepared, don't panic. And just a word about problems. No matter how great and destructive your problem may seem now, remember you've probably only seen the tip of them. And thank you, and I'm sorry for going over time.